بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سو پلیز ڈسائڈ الاؤڈ سلاوات سو وی ول اسٹارٹ آر پروگرام ود قرآن ریسائٹیشن فار دیٹ آئی ول ریکویسٹ طلحہ چاولہ ٹو کم فارورڈ اینڈ ریسائڈ سورہ فجر سلاوات اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والفجر ولیال عشر والشفع والوت واللین اذا یسر حل فی ذالک قسم لذی حجر الم تر کئی ففعل رب کے بیاد ارم دماد التی لم یخلق مثل حافل بلاد و سمود الدی نجاب الصخر بن واد و فر آؤ ندل اوتاد الدی نتوفل بلاد فکثر فی حل فساد فصب علیہم رب کا سوتا عذاب ان رب کا لب المرصاد فاما الانسان اذا مبتلاہ رب ہو فاکرم ہو ونعم ہو فیقول ربی فیقول ربی اکرما وَأَمَّا مَنْ إِذَا مَبْتَلَاهُ فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانًا كَلَّا بَلْ تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا تُحَاضُّونَ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ أَكْلًا لَمَّا وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا کل ادا دکت الرد دکا و جا رب ون ملک صف صف و جی ایوم ادم بھی جہنم یوم ادیت دکر انسان و ان لہ ذکر یقول یا لئی قدم تل حیاتی فَيَوْمَ إِذِلْ لَا يُعَذِّبُ عَذَابَهُ أَحَدْ وَيُوثِكُ وَسَاقَهُ أَحَدْ يَا أَيَّتُهَا النَّفْسَ الْمُطْمَئِنَّةِ ارْجِعِي إِلَى رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَّةً فَادْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَادْخُلِي جَنَّتِي صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوان ما شاء الله so now I will request uh, Muhammad Ibrahim to come forward and recite a salam سلوان سلوان باب الحوائج امام القادم رب جب گدا دین دا مارننگ فالوئرز رباب الحوائج امام القادم رب جب گدا دین دا مارننگ فالوئرز His son Reda was his successor, the guardian of his masuma. She dearly missed her beloved father, who was away from Madinah. 
who was away from Madina, the Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim, the Bridge of Baghdad, and the Morning Followers, the Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim. The bridge of Baghdad and the morning followers. Alone in the prison for many years. Away from his family and followers. Communicating they wrote letters. They yearn to see their true leader. They yearn to see their true leader. The Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. The Babul Hawaj. Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. What poison did Harun give? His body is infused with the shackling chains. What would happen to Masuma? Oh, how would she see her father's state? Oh, how would she see her father's state? The Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. The Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. Tortured in the depth of many prisons, the darkest and most dreadful dungeons, with chains in a terrible position. The mother loom imam had been poisoned. The mother loom imam had been poisoned. The Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. The Babul Hawaj. Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers, drenched in blood, shackled in chains, neglected three days on the bridge of Baghdad, life lifeless, he lay bruised all over. Shroudless he laid on the bridge of Baghdad. Oh, shroudless he laid on the bridge of Baghdad. The Babul Hawaj, Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. The Babul Hawaj. Imam Al Qadim, the bridge of Baghdad, and the morning followers. Salawat. Mashallah. Recite a loud salawat. Now I will request uh, Murtaza to come forward and recite a salam.
افسوس نبی زادیوں کا شام میں جانا سجا چھپتی تھی نبی زادی نبی زادی کے پیچھے کس شرم و حیا سے اور شم سجاد سے پوچھو بیٹھے ہوئے دربار میں سب چھوٹے بڑے تھے سادات کھڑے تھے سرتشت میں رکھا ہوا زینا کو دکھانا سجاد سے پوچھو جب دو شبیر نے زندہ میں قضا کی آفات کی گھڑی تھی وہ ننی سی میت بندے سجاد سے پوچھو افسوس نبی زادیوں کا شام میں جانا سجاد سے پوچھو Now I request Aga Suleiman Hassan Abdi Sahab to come and address today's Majlis Yaza. Salawa.
سورة الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب قلوب الصادقين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي من أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته before we begin today's majlis, I would like to request you to remember the marhumin of the sponsors of today's program and recite Surat Al-Fatiha for Sayyid Ghulam Hussain Rizvi, Sayyid Tasawwur Hussain Rizvi, Tahzib Raza Rizvi, and Sayyid Baryab Hussain. For these marhumin, please recite Surat Al-Fatiha after Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Once again, please recite Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Today we are commemorating two very important personalities in Islam and two great tragedies that befell our religion. They are the martyrdom of our seventh Imam, the heir and successor of our prophet Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim alayhim as -salam. which according to narrations took place on the 25th of the month of Rajab and the death of the Prophet's protector and his uncle and in many ways a person who was like a father for the Prophet and that is Abu Talib ibn Abdul Muttalib alayhim as -salam. And of course, that means that we are coming now towards the end of the month of Rajab, and we are looking now towards the month of Sha'ban, and after that, the month of Ramadan. So I will begin with just a brief reminder for myself and for all of us. In Islamic spirituality, there is a process for our movement towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that the month of Ramadan is Shahru Diyafatillah, the month of the divine invitation. Throughout the month of Ramadan, we are guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways that we honor that divine invitation is by coming together with each other for worship and for remembrance of Allah. In the post-COVID period, many of us, we have gotten in the habit of virtual attendance. Sometimes we have classes that used to be in person. They have come 
online. We may have meetings that we normally used to do in person and they have come online. Many people who did not used to work from home, now they either work from home full time or part of the time. And all of that is perhaps a welcome change if it gives us more flexibility and more time for ourselves and for our family. But there are some things that you cannot phone in. You cannot dial in. And when it comes to our religious practice, the purpose is not just to learn. The purpose is not just to have an efficient or a uh, learning experience, but rather it is to become somebody that is closer to Allah than we were in the past. If I learn, but I don't change, then I have wasted the learning. If I know what is right, but I don't do what is right, then I have wasted what I know. And even if I do what is right for myself, then I have wasted an opportunity that Allah has given me because the goal of reforming myself is to create a change within my family and within my society so that worship of Allah and good practices becomes part of our society and our culture. The Quran doesn't remind us time and time again to do salat. The Quran reminds us aqimu salat, establish prayer. Because establishing prayer is more than just to do it. It is to make sure that prayer becomes a source of unity among believers and it becomes a cultural practice for all mu'mineen and something that believers are recognized by. And in the early days of the Islamic world, one of the names that Muslims were known by is al-musallun, those who would come together and pray. You can't do that virtually. And you can't do that individually because it is part of our collective identity and community that we build. And so when we are guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan, let us come together as a community. And the way that we can practice and become effective working together as a community is to worship and to be together as often as possible in our worship, in our salat, in our dua, even in our meals, so that it becomes part of our personality to share our lives, our goals, our aspirations with our fellow believers. So the goal and the high point of our religious year is to be guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be together with our fellow believers in the service of Allah in the month of Ramadan. And there are two main stages that prepare us for that invitation. One is to remove any impurity from ourselves, and then is to adorn ourselves with good character and good practice. The month of Rajab is both for purification and adornment, but the first stage is istighfar. So to seek forgiveness from Allah by remembering my sins. Sometimes we become complacent. Sometimes we forget what is wrong with us. Maybe I've gotten ahead at work or at school. I've gotten good grades. I have a talent. Maybe I realize that I have more Islamic knowledge than my friends, so I feel pretty good about myself. But we don't realize that all of those talents and opportunities, they are not something I can take pride in. They are something Allah has given me. The Quran says, وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى If Allah gave you intelligence, 
If Allah gave you opportunities to learn, if Allah gave you a good family, if Allah gave you something, then that is not something for you to take pride in, that is a gift from Allah. What you do with it is what you will have in the hereafter. And so let us remember not just what we have done and feel like we are good, but what we can do, what potential there is, what weaknesses we have, so we are motivated to become better. That's the first thing that we do in the month of Rajab. And then in the month of Sha'ban, we take that motivation and that remembrance and we begin to practice good character and good attributes so we are adorned and clean and ready to be guests of Allah in the month of Ramadan. Now, for every invitation, you need a certain amount of time to prepare depending on how formal the invitation is. If I'm going to my friend's house, then I don't need to worry about ironing my clothes and polishing my shoes. And you know, I might just get ready in 20 minutes or so and I might go. But if it's a formal invitation, then I may need to make sure that I send my clothes to the dry cleaners or I wash them. And I might even need to make sure that my car is washed because that is also part of my approach. If it is a formal invitation, I need to prepare myself further before it begins. So the month of Rajab is the time for preparation. The month of Rajab is almost over. If you're on schedule, great, continue. If you're behind schedule, then you just have one month for istighfar, for the cleanliness, for the preparation and familiarization with the Qur'an, with dua, with our values. But don't let it be the end of the month of Rajab. Or a few weeks later, the end of the month of Sha'ban and you're thinking for the first time, how am I going to get ready for the month of Ramadan? So we have a little more than one month. This is fair warning for all of us, myself before all else. Let us prepare. Let us cleanse ourselves, let us adorn ourselves, let us enter the month of Ramadan ready, and let us plan to be together as often as possible, and not just to be at home and listening to a dua on YouTube or attending virtually as frequently as it is possible. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And one of the ways we prepare is by remembering those people who were our role models in Islam. Just remembering Abu Talib salam, just remembering Imam Musa al kadhim salam, it cleanses our heart. And it sets an ideal before us so we become motivated to do more in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than we have done in the past. I would like to say a few words about the uncle of the Prophet, Abu Talib salam, and then the majority of our time we will talk about our seventh Imam and what we learn from his life and from his mission. Abu Talib was the full brother of the Prophet's own father, Abdullah. Same father and the same mother. And he had the dignity and the honor of the leader of Quraysh in his personality. Even though it was known that Abu Talib was not wealthy. But imagine in a society where you have people who worship wealth and people who have mountains of gold. Just like today's society, imagine if you have people with political power and people with millions of dollars in wealth. And then there is somebody there who does not have that wealth. And if those people in a secular and in a materialistic society are always looking to that person who does not have that power and does not have that wealth 
for his guidance and for his leadership, then you can imagine that person is not just first among equals, he is not just a little bit wiser or a little bit more worthy, but he must be almost miraculous in his attributes. That people who worship wealth and have wealth still feel like they are inferior to that person who they admit is their leader. Although people were jealous of Banu Hashim and of Abu Talib alayhi salam. They were people who had bigger families. He had four sons. Many people, they had many sons and many servants and many slaves at that time and much wealth. But that was the dignity and the honor that Allah had given Abu Talib alayhi salam. And the reason for that was because Abu Talib salam was to be the father of Imam Ali and he was to be the guardian and the protector of our Prophet Muhammad Mustafa So just like the dignity of the Prophet was not because of his money and it was not because of the number of swords he had, the number of weapons he had and swords and spears and shields that his followers had. It was because of the power of his message. His protector also was a reflection of that same source of strength, his character and his dignity. And that is why the loss of Abu Talib salam was an irreparable loss for our Prophet. Because in many ways, he was that protection of Islam and of the Prophet. And when Abu Talib salam died, then Allah revealed to the Prophet that now the city of Mecca is no longer safe for you. So prepare for migration. And from that point, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi He began to make preparations for the migration. According to most narrations, it was three years after the death of Abu Talib and the Prophet's wife Khadija when the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Medina. It took those three years for those preparations and that contact with others to become mature. But the beginning was from the death of Abu Talib. That was his importance in the story of Islam and in the life of our Prophet. And from here we will talk about our seventh Imam. There is something that is shared in the lesson we learn from the life of Abu Talib and the lesson we learn from the life of our seventh Imam, Imam Musa al kadhim alayhi salam. And that shared lesson is the importance of discipline in the life of a believer. It's very easy for a person to say everything on their mind. There are some of us, because of the culture that we live in, we think that honesty is the greatest good. Meaning that I say something that I'm thinking and that I'm feeling for me to express myself is always good without a filter and without thinking about the effect of what I am saying. Now Islam wants us to be honest, but Islam wants us to use that honesty in a way that is helpful and constructive to society. That means you don't say something that is wrong but you don't say everything that is right. And you don't say everything that is right in the way that you are feeling it. When you speak, you only speak what is right. And when you speak what is right, you say it in a way that is helpful to Islam. 
Let me just give one example from the life of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu was salam. Because of course this month of Rajab is also the month of our first Imam. In the battle of Ahzab, in the battle of Khandaq, one of the warriors of Quraysh crossed the trench that had been dug by the believers and began to challenge the Muslims for single combat. And because he was known as a very brave warrior, sometimes it was said that he could stand against a, sol a thousand soldiers single-handedly, everybody was afraid. As if they were trees and birds were sitting on their heads, meaning that they were so afraid that they didn't even want to move their heads and maybe the Prophet would say that that is a sign that they are volunteering. So they became statues like trees. And only once after another, Imam Ali says that, Ya Rasulullah, if you call on me, then I am ready. Now, one of the people, and I won't mention the name and the details, but one of the people there said, Ya Rasulullah, let me tell you a little bit about Amr ibn Abdul. And he said that there was a time he went and he was attacked and there were so many people and they were all armed and he was alone and he fought and he defeated and he killed all of them. Is that true? It wasn't a made up story. But at that time, was the need of the Muslims to build their courage and say that whatever comes from Allah is best. And even if we go and we are martyred, then that is a success. And therefore we have no reason to fear his strength or his past or worry about how many people he defeated in the previous years. Which is more honest and more true. So Islam wants us to be honest. But it wants us to be honest by recognizing when is the time to say one thing and when is the time to say something else. Never say what is wrong. But when you speak what is true, think, is it going to be pleasing to Allah or not? Is it going to encourage people to do what is right or is it going to discourage them? We have a responsibility not just to say, but to think about the effects of what we are saying. And there are some things that are honest, but that can cause harm to society. If you are true to Allah and to the goal of your life, then you will remain silent, or you will think about how to express yourself at that time. What we learn from the life of Abu Talib السلام, and the life of our seventh Imam especially is the importance of discipline and purpose in everything that we say and everything that we do. Abu Talib السلام, he lived for 10 years after the introduction of Islam to Arabia. Before Islam had spread to the four corners of the earth, before people became Muslim for power and for influence, when Islam was still oppressed. And there was nobody who had a firmer faith than Abu Talib السلام, who was willing to give his reputation and his life and sacrifice the life of his own two young sons, Imam Ali and Jafar al Tayyar. They were the sons of Abu Talib. And the most precious things to him, he said that stay always with my nephew Muhammad and protect him with your own life. Who could be firmer in faith than one who gives his reputation, who gives his life and then gives his own children's life to defend Islam and writes poetry in praise of Islam. But he never once publicly said anything that would make people know that he was fully a follower and a believer in the message of the Prophet. Why? So that he was able to keep 
a connection and have influence among those people who had not yet accepted Islam. That takes very high piety and discipline. To know something, to believe something, to be able to say it, to hear accusations that you are not knowledgeable, that you are not a believer, and yet to hold on to your faith and not express it except when you are given the command by the Prophet of Allah. And the same thing is there in the time of Imam Musa Kazim alayhi salam. In fact, if we want to speak of the period of Imam Musa Kazim alayhi salam, it is the period of the disciplining of the Shia and giving them an understanding not just of what the teachings of Islam are, but how to implement those teachings at a period of difficulty and oppression. In the time of Imam Muhammad Baqir and Imam Ja'far Sadiq alayhim as -salam, you had thousands of ahadith that had been spread among the Shia. In Kufa, in Khurasan, in different cities, wherever there were followers of Ahlul Bayt, primarily it was the ahadith of our fifth Imam and our sixth Imam. And the period of Imamat of our seventh Imam was longer than the 20 year Imamat of Imam Baqir or the 34 year Imamat of Imam As Sadiq. Our seventh Imam was the Imam for approximately 35 years, a long period of Imamat. And there are many a hadith that we have from our seventh Imam. But at this time, the basic outline of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, they had already been spread among the followers of Ahlul Bayt. That is why historically, if you look at Zaydi law and Ismaili law, even though they didn't have the same number of Imams and they didn't understand all of the Imams appointed by Allah, who was the Imam? But in many ways, their understanding of Islamic law and Islamic doctrine is very similar to our 12 Imams and their teachings. Because they also had access to our fifth and our sixth Imam and their ahadith. That similarity, it's not 100% accurate, but that large similarity is because the majority of the ahadith, they had been spread. But what difference will you find? It is in the balance and the discipline of what is important in Islam. What are the priorities? There are many people who were affiliated with our sixth Imam. There are many people who were affiliated with our fifth Imam. And they may have heard their ahadith and they may even have done their salat and their wudu according to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. But by the time of our seventh Imam, now the Shia were reminded that there is a purpose above just knowing how to pray or how to fulfill your Islamic obligations. And what is that purpose? And what should we be disciplined for? It is to have a belief and a prayer and a trust in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the future. In hadith of our seventh Imam, Imam Musa al kadhim alayhi salam, أفضل العبادة بعد المعرفة انتظار الفرج And there are similar ahadith from our other imams as well. The greatest ibadah after ma'rifah. And this after ma'rifah is true both historically because first our fifth imam and our sixth imam gave the Shia ma'rifah. And in our life, first we gain ma'rifah. What is it that Islam teaches? There are many people who wait and believe in the 12th Imam. They wait for the promise of Allah to come true, but they don't know the practices of their religion. 
And so if you don't have that grounding and if you don't have that ma'rifah, and ma'rifah includes both what we should believe and what we should practice and what we should do. Ma'rifah means we have an understanding of what our goals and what our values are in life. Our beliefs and our practices. If you don't have that knowledge, then you don't have a grounding in your belief in God's promise for the future as well. But once you have that grounding, then prayer and fasting and charity and all of the good deeds that we do, they are not there for us just to earn reward in the hereafter. They are there for us to prepare ourselves and ready ourselves and seek from Allah to make us servants of the path and of the mission of Ahlul Bayt. And the first thing that we need is to believe that my goals are not just to retire early. My goal is not just to get a promotion or to get a degree or to get recognition. My goal is intidharul faraj to serve the goal and the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for me and for all of humanity. And that is for us to understand the promise of Allah for the triumph of Islam and the eradication of evil at the hands of the Mahdi and the awaited one from the family and the progeny of our Prophet Muhammad. So that is the discipline that was given by our seventh Imam on the foundation of the teachings of our fifth and our sixth Imam. Now you know how to pray. Now you know how to fast. Now you know how to live your life according to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and not any faulty or deviant understanding of the teachings of the Prophet. But why? And what are you building towards? That requires us to have discipline. And that discipline, it requires us, first and foremost, to understand God's logic for how we achieve success. How many times is it in life that sometimes we are faced with a choice and material logic tells us one thing and spiritual logic tells us something else. If you look at life materially, given khums may seem to be a burden. And even some of us who do it, we still feel a little pull. So what if you become poor? It's Maybe something that we can do, but we have to fight shaitan in order to do it. Or even sometimes praying, I feel I am so busy. Do I have time for prayer? Can I take five minutes out of my day to do dhuhr and asr? I have so many things to do. Have you felt that? Many of us can relate. That's because we're only looking at a material logic. And we think if I save something up, then eventually I will have it. How much time does it take for what I have saved to be destroyed? You've seen the earthquakes. There are many people, they're not going to be compensated by insurance, even if they have insurance, let alone those who don't. Loss of time, loss of assets, loss of life and health and loved ones, it's a moment. And so life and everything that we have is a gift from Allah. If you drive anywhere, then every day you are stuck in traffic because of one accident or another. You see it on your map and you see it in front of your eyes. And so when I understand the spiritual logic, then I will never say, can I afford to give my khums? But I will say, can I afford not to? Because whatever comes, it comes from Allah. And I can only ask Allah for His protection if I am fulfilling my duty towards Allah. So rather than being a burden, 
it will become a gift and something that I wish to do. Rather than say, can I afford to take time out of my schedule to pray? I will realize that the blessing of my life only comes from Allah. And I will think, can I afford not to pray? Because if I want to achieve success in everything that I am doing, it's going to come from Allah. So I will become motivated to do what is right because I understand the spiritual logic that is at the heart of our decisions and our success. And that is found in a very beautiful hadith of our seventh Imam, Imam Musa al Kadim alayhi salam. He says, Man arada an yakuna aqwa nas, fal yatawakkal ala Allah. If you want to be the strongest person, this is how we have to discipline ourselves. Not just to pray. Not just to give sadaqah, but to want it. And not just to want it, but to realize that we are not giving, we are receiving. The opportunity to pray, the opportunity to give in the way of Allah is not something that we are giving to Allah, but rather something that Allah is giving us. An opportunity and a blessing. If you want to be the strongest person, Normally, how do we want to be strong? We want to be carrying the best weapon. We want to have the most influence. We want to have the most cameras protecting our property and our house and be able to view our security system from our phone and even from afar. We want to be insured. We want to be prepared. That's not strength. Now, there is a concept that people sometimes have to measure wealth. They say, are you able to say to somebody that I quit today? That is a sign of wealth, that you have enough savings and you have enough investments that wherever you're working or wherever you are, you can say to the person, I don't care, I'm walking away today. That's not strength. That's how materially we might measure our strength. How much influence do I have? How much money do I have? How much independence do I have financially or materially? How much insurance do I have? How much surveillance do I have guarding and protecting me? Man arada an yakuna aqwa nas. There's only one way to be truly strong. And that is fal yatawakkal ala Allah. Trust in Allah. And if you trust in Allah, then you will have strength because Allah will protect you and guard you. And in the life of Imam Musa al kadhim he had many struggles. This title al kadhim was given to him because he suffered oppression and imprisonment and alienation throughout his period of Imam, even from those closest to him. But the Imam would hide his own wrath and anger and still show kindness to those who were oppressing him and scheming against him. Harun was the most powerful of the caliphs, perhaps in Islamic history and certainly among the Abbasids. And he was the caliph who was the oppressor of our seventh Imam. Twice he had our Imam oppressed. And the way that he arrested the Imam shows the oppression of our Imam. Harun came to Medina for Hajj. Then he came to the Prophet's grave and he made a big show of doing ziyara. Showed the Muslims that he has come for Hajj and that he has so much money and so much power. And then as he left Medina, he gave the command for Imam Musa Kadhim to be arrested while the Imam was standing in the masjid of the Prophet praying. And although Harun wished to hide 
What his crime was, the people of Medina saw. And the people of Medina now began to speak that what is going to happen to our beloved Imam Musa al kadhim and Soharun, he sent two caravans. One was sent to Basra and one was sent to Kufa. And both of those caravans were made to look as if the Imam is in them. Because Harun wanted to hide from the people that he was taking the Imam and he was arresting them. He was arresting the Imam. He was afraid that maybe somebody would come and try to free the Imam from his captivity. And among those two caravans, our Imam was taken to Basra because the people of Kufa were known to be lovers of Ahlul Bayt and the people of Basra were not known to be lovers of Ahlul Bayt. So the Imam was taken in secret right from by the grave of the Prophet. And he was taken to a city which was known for its antagonism to Ahlul Bayt. And Harun sent message after message that find the most hard-hearted and the most cruel person to be the jailer of the Imam. Twice the Imam was arrested and kept in prison until even the jailers of the Imam, they said, O Harun, you have given us a command, but we have seen nobody better and nobler than this person you have ordered us to keep in our prison. Either take him off our hands or free him because we cannot bear to see somebody like this oppressed in this way. Imagine what must have been the harshness of Harun's command that even hard-hearted soldiers had mercy on the Imam. You can see that when the Imam was transferred to Baghdad, Harun said, I will oversee the imprisonment of the Imam myself. Once Harun was spying on the dungeon in which the Imam was kept, closed off from all sides with just one door that was kept locked and no roof so that the heat of the sun and the difficulty of the elements would affect the health of the Imam. And from a distance, Harun with his advisor Fadl, they were walking and Harun didn't see the Imam. He turned to his advisor Fadl, where is the Imam? And what is that cloth that I am seeing as if it is spread on the floor of the dungeon? And Fadl said, oh Harun, that is not a cloth. That is the Imam that you have imprisoned. He goes into prostration after Fajr and he doesn't lift his head from prostration until the time of Dhuhr. And because he was in prostration so close to the ground, Harun thought that it was not a person. It was just cloth that was on the ground so much had the Imam suffered and so thin had he become in that dungeon. And still Harun continued to scheme until he sent the Imam under the imprisonment of a person known as Sindhi ibn Shahik, a person who is said to have no mercy in his heart. When we send our salam on the seventh Imam, we say, Assalamu ala al muadhab fi qa'ar sujoon. Peace be to the one who was tormented and tortured in the depths of the dungeons of Harun. That was how the Imam spent the last years of his life. Sindhi, he would arrange one form of torment and another until Harun sent a command that, O oh, Sindhi, I am sending dates to you. These have been poisoned. Give them to the Imam and stand over his head and tell the Imam that Harun has sent these, these dates specifically for you and you must eat all of them because this is the gift of the Caliph. And Sindhi, he came with harshness. He gave those dates to the Imam and the Imam began to eat. He ate, according to some narrations, nine of those dates and then he stopped. And Sindhi said that you are to eat all of these. 
And the Imam said that, Sindhi, what you have wished has been accomplished. And don't fear that you need to give me any more poison. Sindhi denied that there was any ill intent. And he arranged for 80 prominent members of the community of believers and prominent scholars in Baghdad to come to the Imam after the Imam had been poisoned. The Imam was transferred to a room that had apparently luxurious arrangements. And the Imam was placed among those luxuries and the witnesses were brought. And Sindhi said, people say that the Imam is being oppressed. People say that the Caliph has imprisoned the Imam. See, we have kept him in luxury. There is no sign of any injury on his body. He is the beloved guest of the Caliph. He is ill and the Caliph is waiting for his health to be better and then he is going to invite him into his presence. And then the Imam spoke with a weak voice. And he said that do not listen to what this jailer is saying. I have been poisoned and the sign of the truth of what I am saying is that tomorrow my color will change and my face will become yellow. And the day after that, my face will turn to a red color and after that I will be martyred. And those witnesses said that we saw that the color drained from the face of Sindhi and he realized that his plan had been now ended by the Imam and the Imam had spoken of his own martyrdom. How did the Imam spend those days when he could not speak to his Shia and he could not even visit with his own beloved son, Imam Rada, and his family members. The Imam was alone, poisoned. His body was changing from one color to another as the poison affected his body and his voice. And as the Imam breathed his last breaths, he turned his attention towards his ancestor, Imam Hussein in Karbala. He said that I send my salutations upon you, O oh my grandfather Hussein. You were alone on your deathbed, surrounded by enemies. And I am alone in my death, surrounded by enemies. But how different it is that although both Imam Musa Kazim and Imam Hussein were alone, Imam Hussein was attacked from from every side and Imam Musa Kazim he did not have drawn weapons but rather after he had been martyred his body was brought out in the public and it was placed on the bridge and an announcement was made Hada Imam this is the Imam of the Rafidah this is the Imam of the Shia who used to hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would fulfill his promise to them and put an end to their suffering come and recognize that the Imam of the Rafidah has now died and it is said that it was as if Baghdad was a scene of the Day of Judgment. Thousands upon thousands of people, they came out of their homes grieving and mourning spontaneously so that even the government began to fear. And Harun gave the command that Imam Musa Kazim was to be given an honorable burial. Otherwise, even in death, Imam Musa Kazim had the strength to overthrow the throne of, Yaz of the Yazid of his time. The command was given and the funeral of Imam Musa Kazim was taken from honors from that bridge over the Dijla River and he was placed in the cemetery where the shrine of the Imam currently resides. Imam Musa Kazim, he was buried far from his family and far from his home in the city of Baghdad. But his shrine now is the protector of the Shia and the believers in that area. The memory of the Imam is what Baghdad is associated with. And those who oppressed and those who killed Ahlul Bayt, their memory has been forgotten. 
let us remember our Imam on the day of his martyrdom and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, O oh Allah, as you honored Imam Musa Kadhim with an honorable burial among thousands of people, even in the capital of his enemy, grant us the ability to visit the shrine of Imam Musa Kadhim and express our loyalty and give him our allegiance and say that we believe in the promise of Allah and in the promise of Ahlul Bayt. Ala na'natullahi ala al-zalimeen wa sayya'lamu al-ladhina zalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा न मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा न मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा मिलके बोलो माशाल्लाह कै कैदी जो मर गया है बेवतन है है जिंदा मैं मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा तड़प के कैदी ये कौन बेवतन बेजुर्मो बेखताही बेजुर्मो बेखताही जिस पर से तम हुआ है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदान में तड़प के कैदी गया है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदान तड़प के कैदी ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन बेवतन है हाय जमीन पर क्यों आजास मनाया कैदी पाया दीवारों दर पे किसने दीवारों दर पे किसने इसका लहू मला है ये कौन बेवतन है है जिंदा मैं तड़प के कैदी जो मर गया है ये कौन है जिंदा मैं तड़प के जो मर गया है ये कौन बे कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम ने जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम ने जमाने आए कैसे
ऐसे परदेश में काजिम जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम ने जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम ने जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम ने जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम जमाने आए हाय मजदूर जनाजे को उठाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए चूर है आए नजफ और मदीना सारे बेटे प्यारे हाँ मेरा लाल तुझे सारे ले जाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में हो गए कैद खत्म मूसा काजिम मेरे कैद खाने कल आओ मैं सद के तेरे बकिया वाले हैं तेरा सोग मनाने आए कैसे परदेश पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश बाप जिंदान में है घर में है सोग बपा बेटियां मूसाए काजम की ये देती है सदा काश के बाबा हमें सीने लगाने से परदेश पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश कैद में कहता रहा सातवा मेरे माम हाय काजम या सकीना हो या बगदाद या शाम हम तो नाना है तेरा दीन बचाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश हो गए कैद खत्म मूसा काजिम मेरे कैद खाने से निकल आओ मैं सद के तेरे बकिया वाले हैं तेरा सोग मनाने कैसे परदेश में काजिम 
के जमाने आए कैसे परदेश बाप जिंदान में है घर में है सोग बपा बेटिया मूसाए काजिम की ये देती है सदा काश के बाबा हमें सीने लगाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए मजदूर जनाजे को उठाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम पे जमाने आए कैसे परदेश में काजिम अल्लाह मोहम्मद व आल मोहम्मद मत हो जाए जारत बिस्मिल्लाम اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليك يا ابا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن امير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوسيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمه الزهراء سيد النساء العالمين السلام عليك يا غريب الغربا السلام عليك يا معين الزعفاء والفقراء السلام عليك يا شمس الشموس السلام عليك يا نيس النفوس السلام عليك يا مدفون بارز توس برازي بالقدر والقضاء علي بن موسى رضا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام على الحسين وعلى علي ابن الحسين وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى اصحاب الحسين السلام عليك يا صاحب الاسر والزمان الامان 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 من فتنه الزمان السلام عليك يا شريك القران السلام عليك يا خليفه الرحمن السلام عليك يا امام انس والجان اجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله مخرجك وزهورك ورحمه الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد few announcements about our upcoming programs so tomorrow we will have an english program for eid mabas and Saturday we will going to have Urdu program for Eid e Mabas and it will also be a multi family kunde program and then on Sunday we will have majlis on departure of Imam Hussain from Medina so so, so on so for saturday for tomorrow's program uh, aga suleiman hasan abdi sahab will going to be the speaker and on on saturday and sunday maulana amir mukhtar faizi sahab will be the speaker so